So most approaches to change attack behavior. I'm gonna get you in the gym, you're gonna pick up the phone more, make more phone calls, we're gonna start saving more money, and we're gonna start doing all these things that are behavior driven. Mm -hmm. And so if we know we change behavior, we get a new result. But the reality is, how do we typically respond to behavior change? Acceptance or resistance? Resistance. Resistance. What drove the behavior in the first place? Ah. Which would be your belief system. If I affect your belief system, you're going to behave in accordance to that belief system. Well, we had the pandemic caused a massive shift in values. If you look at patriotism, it was like number one. Emotions okay. started becoming number one priority. Yeah. How we feel about something. Other value shifts too. People wanted more meaning and connection at work. Yeah. They didn't just want to get paid, right? Money started kind of coming down and they wanted choices. That led to the great resignation. 76% of people wanting to leave their work. There was no connection, no meaning at work. People started asking questions and now we have more options than ever. So if I had the internet, do you think I would have worked at Kmart when I know I can start making TikToks and YouTube and start making, or hustling, you know, flipping. Sure. If you're talking to a 20 year old today, 30 year old today, and the benefit of going through the grind and going through a Kmart job or a Walmart job yeah. and, and working minimum wage has made a lot of entrepreneurs who they are today. 100% agree. That's where we messed up. Bingo. I go, we have robbed our children yeah. of two critical things. One is disappointment yeah. and loss. Yeah. We have to feel disappointment. We as parents had great intention of protecting our kids. It was well intended, poor outcome. Yeah. That's just not life. Yeah. Life isn't perfect. Life is full of struggle. Life is full, full of mistakes, uh -huh. full of error, full of sin, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It is full of it. And the, to err is to be human, but to forgive is to be divine. So joining me in the studio today is Mr. Rene Rodriguez. I've actually ran around circles when I was in the mortgage community as an insurance guy with uh, Stephen Marshall. It was uh, uh, Dave Savage. These guys, they were putting together mortgage events. That's when I ran across Rene Rodriguez. And very excited to have him here in the studio because he is a leading authority on leadership and influence, a best-selling author, a Wall Street Journal best-selling author mm -hmm. to that, mm -hmm. of, of his book. And you were discussing here today uh, but for the last 27 years, Rene has been researching and applying behavioral neuroscience to solve some of the toughest challenges in leadership, sales, and change. So, Rene, welcome to the Seven Figure Squad Podcast. Uh, honored, honored to be here, my man. I've, I've been watching you, and you've, uh, your trajectory has been fantastic. Oh, praise God. Amen. Yeah. I've, I've, got a, uh, I've got a lot of uh, 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 text messages back and forth with Amir and I about you, and he connected on a group message. I'm like, goodness gracious, here's this guy. Now in Dallas, you just did an Amcon yeah. uh, event here too. How, how, was, how was the event for you guys? It was good. We, we took a, a different approach to it. It's the, the, the challenge when you're doing events, as you know, is will people show up? And then you're faced with another decision. Is like, do I pull a draw speaker, like a celebrity, to entice people to come and then deliver value, hopefully somewhere in there. But then, or do you say, okay, I'm going to create value and have impact speakers that maybe people don't know. It's just going to require a massive sales effort yeah. ahead of time to, to educate and tell people who they are. We've always chosen the, to, to have the impact speakers, and man, we, we oversold the event. It was incredible. The community, the camaraderie, there was no egos on the stage. It was just pure value delivery. Everybody was grateful to be on stage. Everybody was grateful to the audience, and then the speakers stay afterwards and hang with the audience members. It's just a really fun experience. Yeah, so how do you define an impact speaker versus a, like a, uh, a influencer type of speaker? Yeah, and, and there's no, I'm not saying one is better than the other, mm -hmm. because I, a lot of the, the celebrity speakers are friends of mine, and, I, and I'm fortunate and lucky if I'm ever on a stage with them, so I have massive respect for them. An impact speaker would be somebody that maybe you haven't heard about yet. They haven't figured out the social media uh, algorithm yet, but they have been doing their work for 30 years, and they've been part of some of the biggest brands in the world. And so they're not really public to people, but they are known by the right people as the only person. And so I have a lot of those folks that I, that I work with. And I have to because my clients, I, I don't have the luxury of going in and having a rah-rah mm -hmm. session and then leaving. Right. I'm held accountable to a result. And so that's my 30-year career has been saying, how do I actually take you from point A to point B? If I don't get you to point B, you don't get paid or you don't get hired back. And so you bring that sort of mentality to the keynote world and to creating events. It, it does create a different experience. There's a... You know, conundrum in the uh, the speaker uh, event community. You know, it's either we do Zoom, mm. and we, where you can cheapen it down and get a lot more access, a lot more people flood in the event, yeah. and go online, and you put these Zoom boards all over the studio, right? right. It kind of looks cool if you're a speaker and you're surrounded by a bunch of Zoom faces, or you can do live yeah. in-person events. What has been most impactful for you, for you guys? So that's that's interesting. Let's talk about the Zoom boards behind you. That serves only one person, which is the speaker. 
because it's still 100% of the people are by themselves in front of a laptop or a computer. Right. And what I, I, I trained a lot of speakers that were great keynote speakers that tried to be <laughs> keynote stage speakers on Zoom. You know, they, you got to do this, and they're talking to the camera as if they were on a stage. Now, that energy works if you've got 1,000 people plus in the room. Yeah. But I'm by myself in front of the computer with someone pointing at you and doing yeah. this, and I'm like, hey, um, Zoom keynotes are conversations one-on-one. -on -one. They just have to be a 1,000 one-on-one conversations at the same time. And so your voice has to change, your body language has to change, and it's less about animation of your body, which you do have to use it, mm -hmm. but you have to create some sort of what we call dopamine. So there's gotta be a change in stimulus all the time. Cam camera angles need to shift. That's why a movie will change angles or a tight shot or a yeah. wide shot. Learn how to do overlays so things can come up on stage. Stop doing the, uh, let me share my screen delay. Uh, can you guys see it? And which kills the entire message vibe. But you have to be able to program it so it just comes up on stage and goes away, just like a TV would yeah. And if you're watching the news. Got it. So how does it serve the person that is attending and investing? Uh, what has been more impactful for yours? Is somebody just attending it on Zoom or somebody really getting in? Because I mean, you can have all the cuts online, but you know, I've always experienced you, you can't catch a concert online. You got to catch a concert in the concert. You know, it's, so there's, there's, there's two approaches. One thing is that they're serving two different purposes. And so I tell people, I said, don't mix them. They serve two different purposes. Can you create community connection online? Yes. Think about it. We watch full-length movies, binge watch our favorite TV shows, and we're in the movie theaters, and all we see is what's on that little screen. We can mm -hmm. watch it on our phone and be locked in on something. So it's not the fact that it's Zoom or remote. It's the way it's delivered. Mm. Now, they spend millions to make sure the camera angles are right, the lighting is right, the audio is great. All those things have to be in play. And so when we, we lost all of our events in 2020, in March, we're like, okay, we're doing 100 events, best year ever. We lose them. And we're like, okay, we have nothing, no in-person gatherings, nothing. I'm like, I gotta get good on camera, and I don't like camera. So we did that, and I'm like, okay, I gotta figure this out. And every one of our, our, our bureaus and event planners were saying, ah, you can't do it on Zoom. I'm like, then why do we watch our movies? I mean, there's a way. So I called directors, I called movie producers, I, I talked to people at Harvard that do this, and I said, what's the, what's the reason? They said, you have to solve one thing, disassociation. Hmm. I'm like, okay, so like a serial murder disassociates from their client, I'm like, from their victim? Like, Kinda, but you disassociate from Zoom. So then you go, why? Okay, what? So you can barely hear you. The lighting is bad. The audio is bad. I don't know what's going on. I got all the other distractions that are better than you because you're just a talking head that doesn't move. Yep. So the human eye in the human experience doesn't get engaged by that. And so then we have to replicate the in-person experience. So for example, it's simple. Like right now, you and I are looking eye to eye. Mm -hmm. You're not standing, I'm not sitting. Why? Well, we have standard office design and height chairs. So then the eye is in Zoom world would be the camera placement. But sometimes the camera's over here, sometimes the camera's over there, sometimes uh -huh. we're looking over here, hey Matt, it's great to <laughs> see you, right? And you're over here, but I'm seeing you on screen. <laughs> and so we're trying to merge all of those different pieces. So we merge teleprompter, right? We put the yeah. camera there, instead of putting words on there, people think a teleprompter is about words. Teleprompter is just a screen that points at a, a mirror. Yeah. Well, why not put the Zoom call on there instead of words? And so now I'm looking at your face, on the other side of your face, looking through a mirror, and the camera's there. So now I can see your facial expressions, you can see mine and it's in person, then we get really great audio, good lighting, and you get a decent camera. And all of a sudden it starts to work. Got it. When we when, when talk about neuroscience, you know, one of the things that I always discuss with a lot of people that are maybe stuck financially, entrepreneurially, maybe even, even spiritually or emotionally, they're in their own way. Yeah. So, so what, what are some of the processes or ways you've coached people over your 30 year experience to how to get people to get their mind right? Sure, I, I think it begins with, understanding how our results are generated. So if we think about the simple model, like our results, anything with its financial results, weight, uh, health results, we had that conversation, any sort of result always comes back. What does that come from? Our behaviors. So most approaches to change attack behavior. So we're gonna change behavior. I'm gonna coach you on your behavior. I'm gonna get you in the gym. You're gonna pick up the phone more, make more phone calls. We're gonna start saving more money. And we're gonna start doing all these things that are behavior driven. Mm -hmm. And so if we know we change behavior, we get a new result. But the reality is, how do we result to, how do we typically respond to behavior change? Acceptance or resistance? Resistance. Resistance, and so that, if you try to attack behavior, we lead to resistance, and now you're dealing with a whole different part of the brain called system one, and the basal ganglia, something very low that starts to fight change. And we're going, okay, if we know that's the actual process, let's not try to change behavior. And what you're doing here is you're going, what drove the behavior in the first place? Ah. Which would be your belief system. Right. If I, if I affect your belief system, 
you're going to behave in accordance to that belief system. And that then the results follow automatically. So our, all of our efforts are your beliefs, what do you, your values, if, you know, it could be your faith, it's a mm -hmm. strong part of your belief system. Like, well, how were you raised? I mean, there's all these things. Like, if you believe that, uh, you know, food equals love, which is how I grew up, being Cuban, right? <laughs> of course. You probably know that, right? right? Being Filipino, same thing. Same thing. <laughs> and so when I was cut from my basketball team, I was like, alone, I didn't know where to go, so food was great. I still, I didn't work out as much anymore, but I still ate like I was an animal. And all of a sudden, the results, the behaviors, it led to food, and I got overweight. Okay, well, I had to change the belief system before I start changing behavior because nobody wants to eat chicken and broccoli because if you don't believe it, yeah, right? Yeah. So that's, it happens in, in sales, it happens in, in money, that happens in, you name it, it's the process of how we change our behavior. So how do I get from eating a lot of chocolate chip cookies and ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind you of productive. You have a probably better answer than I do, my man. I mean, you guys, you look like a freaking war hero, action hero. Well, you are a war hero, and you look like an action hero. <laughs> the, 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 uh, my trainer's watching, so, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's by the way, my, my shout out to my, my trainer, Milton. He, uh, he relocated from Chicago to, to Dallas, so we came nice. down here from, from Chicago. Um, you know, Zoom. The, the changing economy, what's, what's going on in our world, a lot of businesses is shifting. What have you observed as a coach, as somebody in the entrepreneurial space? What have you observed as things that are shifting and what's some of the opportunities that mm -hmm. you can see people take advantage of? Well, we had the pandemic caused a massive shift in values, right? So before, if you look at patriotism, was like number one. And it was like, it was like if, you were, if you had a flag, everything was great. Mm -hmm. Then we started shifting, sadly, away. There was a, the yeah. Wall Street Journal had a big shift and showed patriotism fell almost at the bottom. Yes. Right? And yeah. so then, you know, yeah, people's emotions about started becoming number one priority. Yeah. How we feel about something. And, you know, and I'm not getting political, but it was, it was literally one of those things that just shifted any sense of taking responsibility. For what's going on now there was some all the other value shifts too people wanted more meaning and connection at work yeah they didn't just want to get paid right money started kind of coming down and they wanted choices i want to know who my manager is am i doing my best work am i does my manager care about me who are they do they yeah. know me yeah. and so that led to the great resignation 76 percent of people wanting to leave their work right and so then why my personal belief I actually wrote this for chief executive magazine it was because managers didn't show up and they didn't, they didn't fill the gap of the relationship. And so I assume because I have a CRM. Well, let's even yeah. go back even further. Yeah. 50 years ago, people died very close to where they worked and where they, where they were born. They lived in tight-knit communities. If I went to the grocery store, my boss was probably there, my coworkers. Mm -hmm. If I went to <clears throat> a baseball game for my kids, he, my boss or my coworkers might have been the coach. Mm -hmm. uh, church, we're all in it together. And <clears throat> all the things, it was just these tight-knit communities. So then we advanced technology, transportation, and communication. And we start willingly start moving further and further and further away because, but we, but no, hold on, we're not, I'm not far away. I can just look at my CRM. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're 28 phone calls today. Yep, we got conversion ratio. I got my whole team right here. Yeah. And so we think by that moving away that we still know each other, but we don't. We don't get the nuances of facial expressions. We don't get the timing of when someone's joking or being real. There's all these sort of nuances of a relationship yeah. that if you have time, there's no gap being filled. But if I remove all that, I don't know you anymore. I, I know your behavior, but I don't know you. And so there was no connection, no meaning at work. People started asking questions, and now we have more options than ever. Like I think Gary Vee said it great. He goes, he goes, if I had the internet, do you think I would have worked at Kmart when I know I could start making TikToks and YouTube and start making, <laughs> or hustling, you know, flipping, sure. flipping like you know yeah. coffee mugs? Yeah. Like that's that's the reason they have more choices. Yeah. That was a mind shift for me too. By the way, there's a series of videos out there of whether it's millennials or Gen Zs basically complaining how hard it is in their generation at their age compared to maybe the Gen X or the baby boomer generation. Things cost more money or we might get paid as much. Our homes cost yeah. a lot of money today because they have that comparison. Well, their buddies are also making money on TikTok. They're making money online. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. some salacious ways of making money even with pornography. Yeah. All the crazy ways that, that people are making money today and, and selling their stuff online. I mean, where would I be today? I mean, if you're talking to a 20-year-old today, 30 old today, and the benefit of going through the grind and going through a Kmart job or a Walmart job yeah. and, and working minimum wage has made a lot of entrepreneurs who they are today. 100% agree. So I said, that, I said that to an audience and I said, and I was kind of testing, I set them up a little bit and I said, because I do believe this, I said, how many people are a little, let's say, frustrated with the interesting level of, of work ethic for Gen Z's? And they all go, whoa, oh, right here. And I said, and I'm like, let them, you know, be like, oh, they're, they're this, they're that, and the thing. I said, I go, yeah, I hear you. I said, next question, who raised them? 
and the same hands go up. And I go, uh, mm-hmm. I go, but mm-hmm. now hold on a second, because I, I did too. I yeah. said, now how many of you had a hard upbringing? All the same hands go yeah. up. And so then, and how many of you vowed to never let your children go through what you went through? They go, yes, yeah. I see it. And that's where we messed up. Bingo. I go, we have robbed our children yeah. of two critical things. One is disappointment yeah. and loss. Yeah. We have to feel disappointment. I mean, how many times did you lose as a kid mm-hmm. and be like, oh, I'm going to come back at this? Yeah. And you get knocked down and, the, and somebody kicks your butt in something and you're like, you know what? I almost, I got, I got that one move on them. Yeah. I'm going to do it again. And then yeah. years of fighting to see who can win. Instead of now, you fight, win, and it's over. I don't want to play anymore because I didn't win. Yeah. Well, where's my trophy? Mm-hmm. And so there's two pieces. One is, I think, we as parents had great intention of protecting our kids. It was well intended. Poor outcome. Yeah. So with my kids, like probably about 10 years ago, I said, guys, I messed up. I protected you from things I should have let you go through. I said, so we have one of two choices. I said, we can wait for life to teach you the lessons that I should have, or we can start manufacturing some struggle for you. How many kids do you have? Uh, I have six total between my wife and I. Three of them are mine, three are hers. So yeah, six. Wow, age ranges. So hers are four, five, or four, six, and seven. And mine are, or no, four, six, and eight. Mine are seven, 19, 22. Wow. So my, uh, my son just had a kid. Oh, wow. So officially, I'm a, gra- a I'm, a grand- I'm a grandfather, bro. Ooh, congratulations, Crazy. man. <laughs> so, the Jack grandpa so, right here. So, yeah. <laughs> the thing of my son is like, hey, dad, you know, you know the things that you were telling me? Yeah, I, I get it now. <laughs> Isn't that wild how that I, I works? Get, I get it now. I had my son in the audience yesterday, and I got a chance to tell. I, there's a story to share about his journey, and um, he went through a really hard time with, with uh, depression, anxiety, uh, uh, almost suicide, a bunch of stuff. Mm. It, was, uh, it was a horrible two years. But I use that story around the importance of, of the story of a lighthouse. And I shared with him when he was graduating, going to grade school, about the story of a lighthouse keeper and how lighthouse keepers don't wait for others to shine. They don't need thank yous. They just shine. Shine, yeah. They don't Get say, out there. Well, yeah. They don't say, well, well, I'll shine my light when they should shine theirs. And they just they just do their job. And, you know, if, you, if you're about to do something stupid, you know, maybe you're just a bunch of lost ships and you've got to be the, the lighthouse. It's mm-hmm. a short version. And I gave him this lighthouse. And... Uh, same story when he's going into college and, you know, he, he said it was his best gift that he ever had. And he went and got a tattoo, a tattoo of a lighthouse. On his wow. Head. Yeah. And when he was going through his struggle at his lowest points when he wanted to take his own life, he said, and we were in the ER at some point when this was going on, he said, I could never do it because I kept looking at my arm. And it was just like one of those moments where I've told this story hundreds of times. Profound revelation. Yeah, and he, during, he barely remembers it because he was in a really bad place. He's in a great place now, yeah. but he was in a really bad place, and I got a chance to tell that story. Of, obviously, I'm in tears, audience yeah, in tears. Yeah, of course. And he's like, I never knew that side of it for you. And uh, I'm like, now we both know it, and we can be done with it, you know? And he, but he's in such a great place. Yeah. yeah. I think some of the toughest part, Renee, about being a dad is, uh, you know, you want your kids... You know, sometimes you're judge, they, you know, you, they judge your kids. They judge you by your kids. Yeah. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, that's such a hard thing to, that's such a hard thing to, a standard to, to live up to. Like, like, you are judged by how your kids turn out. Like, I was, I'm, I was wrestling with PBD with us. I said, Patrick, how, how can you, so we were debating it. Yeah. And then, you know, Patrick loves to debate, yeah. you know? Because you know, if I look at King Solomon, you know, thousands of kids, right? If I look at some of the people, the most influential people in the world, and he's like, whoa, look at Trump. Yeah, yeah, well, look at Biden. <laughs> so we're, we're, I'm going back and forth. How could you judge a, per, a parent by how the kids turn out? I don't know. So I'm, 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 that's an ongoing conversation with me. You know, I think that, I think that there's, well, let's look at the word judge, right? Let's dissect that. If I were to debate this, I'd say, well, does a parent have influence over their kids? Sure. 100%. Are they a part of whatever the outcome is? Yes. Are they 100% of it? No. And so the word judged, if you're going to judge the parent, I'm like, well, I'm going to judge, what are you doing now? No, okay. What did you do before and did you own it? If you messed yeah. up before, are you owning it now? Yeah. Because if I'm going to judge you for messing up, then I'm being a hypocrite. Because I guarantee you, I know I messed up. Yeah. Even the best parents yeah. are the ones I don't trust. Yeah. If you think you've done it perfectly, mm, that's just not life. Yeah. Life isn't perfect. Life is full of struggle. Life is full, full of mistakes, uh-huh. full of error, full of sin, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It is full of it. And the, to err is to be human, but to forgive is to be divine in that moment. And that's what that means to me. And so 
did the parents mess up? Yes. Well, then are you owning it is the next question. Okay. Okay. Then what are you doing about yeah. it? And if you don't own it, you don't do anything, yes, I will judge you in that sense because you have shown me, I don't even need to judge you, I'm just observing the current behavior. Yeah. And I can take from that, well, no wonder. You messed up? Cool. What are you doing now? Yeah. That's a great way to process it. Um, when we're talking about behavior and the neuroscience behind it, I'm going to go in a direction I didn't think I was going to take it now Let's that you shared with that. So you're a blended family too. Mm -hmm. My wife and I are a blended family. Mm. This some means there's no drama in our families. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right, yeah, zero, right? <laughs> no whatsoever. The biggest thing for me was when I was dating my now wife, how involved is the dad in his life? Because I, I need to know what space I'm gonna play as a yeah. father figure in the house, right? Yeah. And does your son call me dad or yeah. uh, Mr. Sapala or Mr. Matt, whatever. Yeah. I just want to be honored and respected in my house. For sure. Because my other kids are also in there too as well. Was there some of that dialogue with, with you and Maddie? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah it, worked. it was actually it was actually really, really interesting. Well, one, her kids were younger. And my... A car seat's still in the back. Yeah. Like really young, <laughs> right? And so two of them don't know any different. I was just always around. And they call me Nay, right? Yeah. So I said, Renee, and they call yeah. me Nay. And I wanted... I didn't... Uh, and, I, and I wanted to find a, a name that would still respect their father, yeah. right? And, you know, they call me, oh, my dad. They say my dad all the time, you know, my stepdad. They're, they're great about it, but when they talk to me, it's nay. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I mean, their dad is their dad. Mm -hmm. you know? Sure, and, sure. Um, but, you know, it was one of those things that, too, I said at some point, I said, do you want, how in depth do you want me on this? Because if, if you want me in, then that's not happening anymore. You want me to sit back? It's, it's, it's okay. She's like, I want you in. I said, great. I said, cool. And it's, she gives me the space to be that way Got with it. them. And they, um, they're, I mean, they're great kids. Yeah. They listen. They're just, yeah. and they're so coachable, which is what I think is one of the coolest things about a kid when they're just, yeah. they want to learn something. Yeah. And, you know, but so it's, if because she's given me that space, it's been, it's been really good. So let's take a couple steps back. How'd you guys meet? At the gym. Really? Yeah. Yeah, at the gym. Were you the creeper? Were you the creeper dude at the gym? It's funny. Yeah, no. uh, I wouldn't put it past me, but no. The uh, this time was um, we had been in the same gym for probably eight, nine years. Okay, but we never, you know, she was married, I was married. It was kind of one of those like, yeah, gotcha. there's just there was somebody in the gym, and I knew who they were. Sure. And then you know they had got a divorce. I'm single, and one day she sends me a fire emoji. Oh, oh, so online. She started it. Oh, okay. okay. So hey. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Okay. She started, but I'm like, I'm like, oh, hold on a second. <laughs> so you're at the gym, but you're then connected online. On yeah. So remember, you saw the before pictures. Yeah. I was really fat, right? Yeah. And so I went. I started losing a lot of weight, and then I put on my old like suit. I had a suit that uh, yeah. the Rock had, uh, and I told my tailor, I said, I need you to make that suit. Gotcha. Right. And so I had it, and it fit again, and I did. I just did like a little fitting in the thing, and then she put a fire emoji. I'm like, hold on a second, like. Let's I got you. Yeah, she, she didn't need to leave that open door. That's so, so the humble giant that you are, you still connected on social media, mm -hmm. uh, even though you guys were working out at the gym. So, yeah. so it was kind of like casual. Hey, let's connect on social media. Well, it was. It was. If we were, we never really spoke at the gym. Okay. We just knew of each other. Oh right? god, and it was just kind of like one of those things. Got and it. then I was like, "She, this is Maddie." I'm like, "Huh?" I'm like, oh, "We started joking around, joking around." And then ever since that day, it's been every day since that first text, just like nonstop. That's, that's your vibe between her, you and her. Yeah, oh yeah. I love it. Yeah. That's, 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 yeah. the, that's the natural fire. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. So when, when, I, uh, when I started in uh, Sheena, um, I said, okay, babe, okay, how involved is the father in his life? Go check. Are there some, are, are there some boundaries, some areas that, uh, that of, of being a blended family? Because you know, we saw, you know, the Brady Bunch growing up, you know, yeah. kind of like this weird, weird yeah. first exposure to a that's true, right? blended, yeah. blended family, right? Yeah. Mixed family. What was, is there some areas and parameters of that that uh, you go through to make sure you minimize any imagined expectations, to minimize any arguments? Because those are some of the worst arguments with a blended family. Because now you got both your kids are starting to build he, relationships. He's together. an amazing guy. So he's an amazing father. He loves his kids. Um, she, I told her, I said, you will never feel drama from me in regards to him, like ever. And she's great at communicating. It takes a big man to do that, by the way. It, well, it's, it's not, it, you, I mean, you know, it's not yeah. about me. It's about yeah. those kids. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, it's about the kids. Yeah. 100%. And that's why. That's why you're a big man to understand that. Yeah. So a lot of guys who think about it's about themselves. Yeah. No, it's about the kids. You know, if, if, if you know, like he, they know that Christmas and Thanksgiving, if he wants to come, he comes. Like he's, he's been there thanks Christmas and Thanksgiving. And, yeah. And he's respectful to bring like a, a bottle of wine. I don't really drink, but he'll bring a bottle of wine. He'll hang with the kids. And then if they're doing their thing, I'll just, I'll give them their space to do that. 
And, um, but it's, it's like, there's, I'm just not a drama guy. So I have, yeah. I have no need for any of it. Yeah. And to me, it's like, the, the, what do you feel about it? I go, I don't allow a feeling. Yeah. It's not about my feeling. It's yeah. about the kids. Yeah. And at the end of the day, and if you do that, that's, it's just what it is. That's so cool. Yeah. For me, it was, if I ever get one drunk text from you to her, Done. Freaking World World War freaking three, four, and five. <laughs> yeah. You know I mean? Yeah. That that the boundaries are boundaries. For sure. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. He's not that guy at all. He's he's a, he's very cool. Gotcha. Plus, you know, you know, you you got a crew rolling behind you. So <laughs> 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 you, know, you got to behind yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when when you're looking at the behaviors, you know, I, I see also she's very much involved in your business. Uh, how do you guys work together as a, as a power couple, as a power team? Easiest thing is to agree with her. She's the CEO. <laughs> no, she's she's the CEO. She's yeah. she's much better at the business than I am. So you know, I am a vision. I can be in front of the room. I I can set strategy. Yeah. But execution is her. It she she is a robot. She is a killer. Yeah. She's she's very assertive. From I saw last night. Very, very assertive. assertive. Yeah. yeah. Party. Yeah. Very assertive. She she doesn't miss deadlines. She doesn't understand uh, being late. She doesn't understand procrastination. If you say you're going to do it, it's going to get done yeah. at all cost. Yeah. And it's and if like I, I'm like during the pandemic, I, write, I got the deal to write the book. I'm like starting. To, I, I should do a podcast. She goes, "You want to do a podcast?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm thinking so." The next day, my guy's in there. She's like, "I'm like, what are you, what are you doing?" He goes, "Well, how's Ryan here?" She goes, "You said you want a podcast." She's actually she's building your he's yeah. building your studio. Wow. I'm like the next day. Yeah. And I mean, you, Amir, these guys all have to vote for like they don't call me anymore. They just call her. If they want something done, and they know for dates and time, they don't talk to me. I don't. My brain doesn't work on dates. You just are told where to show just up. Show up. Yeah, and, yeah. and operating your in your power. Yeah, spot. but we have three yeah. people that manage my calendar right now. There are three people that have to do it. Wow. It's there's a lot of flights, hotels, moving parts, um, shifting things. A lot of one way flights that so we can get to this one. A lot of JSX. You know, every once in a while, if it's if it financially makes sense, we'll have to take a private to some you know just just a small jaunt. Yeah. Only if it makes sense for me. I'm not a guy that needs to fly mm. private. Doesn't make any. I just can't justify that. But if sure. it, you're getting paid X amount, sure. it costs you X amount to get there. And if you don't get it, you miss it. No, then it makes sense. Sure. It's a business decision at that point. Got it. When, when you're looking at when you look at where America's at today, you know, I you know I strongly believe that the people that turn this country around are entrepreneurs mm. because entrepreneurs are natural leaders. Yeah, the leader of the company. Yep. You know, where 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 where, where is the leadership gap right now in America, the, the transformational gap that needs to be there for more Americans to step up and, and the, the craziness was going on. The city I love, Chicago, where I'm from, it's, yeah. it's, going, it's, going, it's going down bad. Mm. I lost three insurance agents. I was telling Mr. Frankel last night, I lost three insurance agents because they got carjacked for the car, three separate occasions. Wow, and killed. And killed. Right, and so, and, and we live in a fairly decent area, Amir knows this, we live in Oak Brook, yeah. The burbs, bro. You know? So to get carjacked between the city and the burbs, it's not a good thing for, for no. the city of Chicago. Our friends in LA, Patrick's from LA and Glendale. Same things happen in LA. Our friends in, in the Bay Area, San is going bad. Friends in New York is going bad. So we need leaders to step up. Yeah. So, you know, because enough enough is enough. So yeah. What's your thoughts so and perspective I, on? One, I, man, I wish I knew politically what the solution was, and I don't. It, it's, I look to people like you guys to, for that. I go, but what I'll tell you, that the, the, what the core problem is, is fatherless homes. The wow. Day, that's what it comes down to. And wow. if you don't have a father in the home, you can see the domino effect. It's of not a popular answer, by the way. I, I know. <laughs> I know, but truth is. I was a single is. father, yeah. raised my three kids, and I had custody of my kids. But you know, there was where's that study? There was a study that said that uh, to, to raise a kid, the best, the nuclear family is the best way to raise yeah. a child. Yeah. And the second best way, father, is a father raising a child, not the mother. Yeah. So I've been in court where yeah. I had custody of kids. They right right away they signed to the to the mother. Oh, it's always the court, and it, this isn't to say anything negative about women. Like, it's not the, at all. It's it's where we're talking about the drugs and the alcohol and and, and saying that there's. There is that piece, which is the biggest missing piece. And so I think there's a couple things. My answer would be, one, is men need to step up big time. They need to step up, even if, even if the, the, and I'll, I'll take this for myself, even if the, the, the mother is, is, is difficult, men need to step up. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. it's for the kids. It's for the kids, right? They have to be there. And when that happens, and I, and then I also say that women need to chill out a little bit and need to support that process, because yeah. there's some women that make that process really hard, and they start 
and you can say, well, the man should do it anyways. Yes, agreed. Mm -hmm. And why not have some help? Yeah. Why not be a teamwork on this? If it is yeah. about the kids, yeah. then then they both should be letting the egos go, letting the the, the pieces go, and, and and being able to be part of that solution. You know, one of the things that is the most powerful things I've seen you roll with you, just by observation, is your associations. Hmm. So if a woman has a wrong associations, yeah. and the man also has a wrong associations, that yeah. led, those both leads to bad decisions. Absolutely. You know, Tyrese. You know, has, has been very public that Tyrese's ex, she she admitted. Yeah, I had the wrong girls around me. They told me to get divorced and get this from him, get this from him, to get this from him. And the whole time he's been crying in court, get away from me, bad association. There it is. She she exposed it. Yeah. So wh how how would you how would you encourage people to have the right associations around them? It's a deep question, man. I I agree with you. It's it's the we've it, and the thing is it's such a cliche that people don't listen to it. You're the average of the five people. Sure. Right. It's sure. and it's like well we all heard that. Great. What are you doing about it? <laughs> right. And even yesterday, I said I think the answers to life are found in cliches. In cliches, why? The first time you heard it wasn't a cliche. It was profound. It was profound. Wow. I'm the average of the five people. Yeah. Man. And then you start hearing it three, four thousand times. You yeah. just don't listen anymore. Yeah. But if the answers to life are found in cliches, then we need to go back to the answers that are sitting in front of us already. Yeah. And then we need to go. Okay. If I'm a leader communicating that, this is sort of the world of influence. How do you take a cliche and make it? hit. Yeah. So we call it qualifying the cliche. We have to make it, like really bring it back to life in a new way. And so if we know that the people that we, we are around have massive influence on what we do, what we consume from the right. world, whether it's the news or what we allow, it starts to create narratives. In mm -hmm. us. And those narratives we use as constructs of reality. And so if I'm listening to negative information, that's what I have to draw upon to, to understand the world around me, how I explain it. Yeah. And the explanation is the outcome is a narrative. And so that narrative is how I construct and understand the world. And so what I'm consuming, what I'm listening to, who I'm being influenced by, who's giving me advice, all has massive influence to shape my decisions, my beliefs, like everything. Yeah. You get the wrong people around you, you're gonna do stupid, stupid stuff. Exactly. Period. Exactly. One last question before I let you go. What does faith mean to Rene Rodriguez? It's a great question. This is the second podcast in a row. I've had this. So faith, religion, spirituality, if I were to look at faith as a definition, is the belief in something. Maybe I can't see it, but knowing it's there. The, I, I think there's a faith in saying there's something bigger than me. And uh, I look at, one of my favorite quotes is from the Dalai Lama. He said, all major religions have one common goal, which is to make their followers better people. And so that is, becomes the religion for me. Are you a good person? Do you try to make me better? Uh, and are we really at a value set aligned? And I can find those alignments across all religions. I can also find misalignment across all religions. I can find people that are the same religion that are people that I believe are horrible, evil people. Yeah. But I find yeah. people that are from a religion that might be seem opposite that is amazing, we can make the shirt off their back yeah. and will do some great things. And so for me, when I look at this, as a deeper answer, that I look at the proximity and where you grew up usually determines what you believe. That's just a fact. If I was in, in India, I might be Hindu, right? Sure. Just because that's what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. If I was in China, I might be Buddhist. You know, in Middle East, I'd be Muslim. And so then I go, okay, so there's gotta be a better solution than proximity to determine this, right? In, in geography. If geography determines your religion, then maybe you haven't thought about it enough. But now, I love people that go on the search, because then when you go on the search, you start finding what we would call convergent validity. Convergent validity is, Multiple different sources kind of converge into same simple truth. Now, to me, that becomes the truth. Do I believe there's something bigger than us? Yes. Do I believe that that there's wisdom in all of the texts? Yes. Do I believe it's been misinterpreted or could be misinterpreted? Yes. We're mm -hmm. human. Yep. Part of the process. Yep. So, what's the journey of life? Is to find your meaning through that. So, mine is based on several stories from all the, all over the place. I look at the story of creation. It was six days work, one day rest. Right. It wasn't five days work, two days rest. I look at one of the most common words in the Bible was the word toil, sweat of the brow. Hard work was a common theme throughout all of the books, all of the chapters, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Go back to the Old Testament, New Testament. So, so then six days, six to one, hard work. At the end, he asked himself a very specific question before he went to sleep, which was, was it good? Reflection, contemplation, which is the real term for leisure. Work and leisure. Leisure isn't buddy, being friends with your buddies. I studied this for three years in college. It's, it's the act of reflection and contemplation, which would be considered one of the highest forms of prayer to say, 
Am I a good person? Mm. And when one can do that without ego, you get a much more honest answer. And if you really allow that honest answer comes in, I think it dictates your next behavior, either make up for it, become a better person, repent, whatever it is you want to do. Right. And so reflect, leisure, all of those things. Then you look at the story of the, the talents that showed up in all four. Of course. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You say, okay, shows up in all four, hundreds of years apart, shows up in all different texts. And you say, okay, so give you, I'll give you one talent, three talents, and five talents. What'd you do with your five? Ten. Great. What'd you do with your three? Six. Great. What'd you do with the one? You buried it. <laughs> Fear. Yeah, bad, bad, <laughs> bad, bad. So there's a cool concept. If somebody gives you a gift, your job is to multiply that gift yeah. in some way, shape, or form. So I look at this, and then there's one crazy study on, on um, near-death experiences. 2,700 studies or cases, they all died. They see the light, and they were approached with family. So all consistent. But the cool part was they were asked two questions consistently. One was, did you expand... Uh, did you gain knowledge? And I was like, okay, that's a cool question. Second, did you, can you, did you expand your capacity to love? Not did you love people. Did you expand your capacity? So to me, the capacity would be your, the weight room. Like, did you, how, did you increase your bench press, right? Your capacity mm-hmm. to press. So what's the capacity to love? I sat, that, sat with that for about a year. And I think it comes down to one thing. The weight room for, uh, the weight room for love is grace the unmerited favor of God or the undeserving favor. Easy to love somebody and forgive somebody when they're great and they're nice. But what about somebody who stabs you in the back? What if somebody that hurts you really bad? Yeah. What if somebody that's, what if, see loving in, in the inconvenient moments is where the capacity starts to grow. And so I look at all of those things, that my, my purpose, my faith, anything that helps me move towards ut- fully utilizing the gifts that God has given me in expanding my knowledge and capacity to love to further in his creation that's what it is. And so if I can be in line with that, I can find I can find love and community in the Muslim tradition. I can find it in the Hindu. I can find it in Christianity. I can find it anywhere. Yeah. And to me, those are where I find my truth. Yeah. Amazing answer. Yeah. Oh, Especially from a guy with a background in neuroscience. That was <laughs> yeah, a right. very deep faith-based answer, man. So still in the search though. I, I haven't figured it out though. You know what I mean? Still yeah. trying to piece all these things together. I think we'll spend the rest of our lives trying to find out so. those answers. You know, and yeah. uh, but that that's the part of the, that's the exciting part of the uh, the evolution of ourselves, you know, the, the capacity to grow, the capacity to transform, the capacity to to teach others along the way too as well yeah. and, and, and improve yeah. their lives. For sure, yeah. for sure. Renee, I appreciate you being generous with your time while here in Dallas. I hope we reconnect again. We got to do another part two of this on the Millionaire Goals uh, 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 podcast, Seven Figure Squad podcast. But for those of you looking for more information about Renee, we've got all his links here in the comment section, in the description section. So that being said, we're looking forward to your next event. And for you visiting again, the Seven Figure Squad Honored podcast to be here, man. in Dallas. Really true pleasure. Okay, Thank cool. you so much. Man. Awesome. Very good. It. Thank you. That being said, make sure you subscribe, hit like. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you share this video. Till we meet again on behalf of Rene Rodriguez, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Bye-bye.